On this episode, we take a look at the Victory Monument neighborhood, one of Bangkok's busiest and most varied areas. So if you want to get away from those 100% expat areas and you want to check out a more Thai part of Bangkok, you'll get a lot of good info on this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawati crap and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who has spent the past 17 years in Thailand perfecting the technique for building a sand igloo. Whoa. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 17 years ago. Never figured out Thai seating culture on public buses and the MRT and the SkyTrain. And so I never left. <laughs> You're only going to leave when you figure it out? That's right. You'll be here for a while. <laughs> All right, well, we want to say a quick thank you right off the bat to one of our patrons, my buddy Petri, who supports us at the show shout-out level. Uh, stick around after we're done talking about the Victory Monument neighborhood to hear why Petri actually went out and bought a small wood-burning stove, and he leaves it burning all the time on the roof of his Bangkok condo. Whoa, and, and I thought I was weird. Hmm. <laughs> uh, and of course, one of the amazingly cool things uh, that patrons like Petri get is an uncensored unscripted bonus episode every week uh where we talk about all kinds of uh, interesting stuff whatever's on our mind for that week uh and we just finished recording this week's bonus show and we chatted about um seating etiquette on public transport in bangkok uh and how confusing it can be and uh greg's uh story that happened on a bus when when seniors repeatedly tried to offer their seats uh, to his son uh, and how he felt like a jerk for saying no. Uh, We also did another episode of Thai News of the Weird covering a very creepy story about a guy who caught a gangoi hopping ghost uh, with his car dashboard video. Uh, So you need to become a patron as soon as possible so you can uh, listen to this bonus show. I've seen ghosts glide and walk, but I've never seen a ghost hop. You know, we said before that Thai ghost mythology is fascinating and cool and weird. And this uh, hopping ghost, I think, uh, proves our point. Yeah, no doubt. Before we jump into uh, the main episode, uh, don't forget our Season 3 podcast meetup is coming up on Friday, the 16th of November at Smalls on Soy Suan Plu from 7 to 9 p.m. If you're in town, please come down to say hi and meet uh, some other listeners. Uh, It will be fun. We guarantee it. Uh, And we also think some of our guests, some of uh, the people we have interviewed, are also going to show up at Smalls. So if you want any more details, uh, check out our Facebook page. Cool. Hope to see everyone there. And I also want to quickly mention a great project by my buddy Ivan. And after years of work and research, Ivan has written a book in Thai teaching Thais how to properly pronounce English words. This is a genius idea. Uh, I mean, so I don't know your friend. I didn't even know you were going to talk about this, but I did see a story about this new book, and I think it's genius. So anyway, go ahead. Explain what it is. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, as you probably know, Ed, when when Thais say things like get how for guest house or welly for very or speak for speak, it's largely because English is taught using Thai phonetics, which immediately distorts how words are pronounced right off the bat. So Ivan, after after looking at this for a long time, he created his own method to teach Thais how to correct their pronunciations. Now, he's begun a Kickstarter project to donate his book to schools throughout Thailand, which is just a great idea and a great cause. So if you can spare a few bucks, uh, help him out by heading over to kickstarter.com and search for the word Tinglish, that's T-I-N-G-L-I-S-H, to bring up his his Kickstarter campaign. Uh, We'll also include a link in the show notes on our website. So if you can help him out, that's much appreciated. Get some cool literature out to the kids in rural Thailand, and pretty soon everyone will be saying, speak very well, instead of speak welly well. (laughs) All right, so on this episode, we want to continue our look at Bangkok's cool and or notable neighborhoods with a deep dive into the Victory Monument neighborhood as one of my favorite places to hang out, get lost, and eat noodles. 
Uh, and that being said, I don't know a hell of a lot about it. So uh, before we get started, too, a quick shout out to one of our, our patrons, a guy named, by the name of Alessandro, who uh, sent me an email with a couple of points that we could go over because uh, he lives up there. So I just sort of bounced a couple of ideas off him. So he, he helped out here. Cool. Let me, let me say this as we get into Victory Monument. I have to admit, I don't know too much about it, although there's a couple bars uh, that I will talk about around there. But I, I do think the Victory Monument area is fascinating because it's clearly an older part of the city. So I think you know you know a little bit more about the Victory Monument itself than I do, so I'll let you talk about the Victory Monument itself. Mm. So it's a little bit an older part of the city, but then again, the SkyTrain goes right through it. So you have this modern transportation, like monorail-type thing going right around Victory Monument. And it, it just makes Victory Monument, I think, it's kind of cool. I think it's kind of a cool part of the city. Yeah, it's really neat. And just to basically describe how we're going to be talking about it on the show, Victory Monument is basically a, is a big traffic circle with a big monument in the middle. The Victory Monument. Surprise, surprise. And basically, the neighborhood is divided up into quadrants. You have the northwest, the northeast, the southwest, and the southeast. So that's how we're going to be dividing it up uh, over the course of this show. But... Um, Right in the middle, while, while, we're, while we're talking about this right off the bat, let's talk about the monument itself. So right in the middle is the Victory Monument. And a lot of people don't really know what this monument is commemorating. Over the years, I've heard different stories. Now, you know the actual truth. but uh, So I specifically remember um, a, a, girl, a Thai girlfriend of one of my buddies who said that the Victory Monument was to celebrate... Uh, the Allied victory in World War One, because Thailand actually did send some soldiers who fought on the side of the Allies in World War One, but that's not true, is it? Greg? No, and but I can see where that might be might be a common misconception because it does the way it's designed. It looks kind of like a a war memorial that we would see it in does. the West. Like this is a memorial for all of the soldiers who gave their lives in all of the wars that we have fought in, kind of thing. But right. it's actually a monument to a very specific war. And we did cover this in our episode a few weeks back about Plek Pibin Songkram, um, who was the guy who commissioned it uh, to celebrate the victory of the Thais in the Franco-Thai War, which is when the Thais fought the French in the waning days of, the, of, of their Indochina properties, in, which is now Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos. So um, there was a battle. I won't get into it, but the Thais won. And that's what this monument is commemorating. So it's commemorating this battle of the Franco-Thai War. So is it accurate then to say, since, as we covered in the Pibun episode, since he's essentially a Thai fascist, so can we say that this is a fascist monument? Well, I'm just looking at the Wikipedia page, and it says the monument is entirely fascist architecture in design. Yeah, it's got an Egyptian <laughs> obel- it's got an Egyptian obelisk, five statues representing the Army, Navy, Air Force, Police, and Militia. Why does it have an Egyptian obelisk? Uh, well, it says uh, the, the obelisk has been frequently used in Europe and in the U.S. for national and military memorials. It says the, the, the monument was created by Italian sculptor Corrado Ferracci, who worked under the Thai name Silpa ba- ba- Birasi, and who, of course, is the namesake of Silpacon University, which is the famous artistic university in, in Thailand. So it's um, actually designed by an Italian. I wonder if he was like an actual fascist. Like, I wonder if he was like Mussolini's architect. Well, it said the sculptor did not like the combination of his work with the obelisk and referred to the monument as the victory of embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we talked about that period in Thai history on our first Thai history episode because that whole period is the weirdest time in Thai history. There's just no doubt about it. Yeah. Anyway, the, the monument was erected in 1941. And now it stands at the center of the Victory Monument neighborhood. Let's 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 start. Let's go clockwise. Let's start with the northwest quadrant of of the Victory Monument. Now, the northwest quadrant um, is basically cheap housing and a lot of street food. Um, and one of the big highways sort of runs under here too. That's the Sirat Expressway Toll Road, which kind of runs a bit north to the of the Victory Monument. And underneath that. Is a lot of street food at night, and a lot of people come out and sell all the like sort of night market stuff. And there's a gated community there, and some of the roads connect with what eventually turns into sort of the Ari neighborhood as well. So that's kind of where it ends. But there's not a lot to talk about in the Northwest Quadrant because it's just basically sort of like street food, 
couple of condos, a gated community, and that's about it. Well, I mean, there is, just in general, every time I go to Victory Monument, there's just a ton of street food. I mean, just in general. It's like even right in the middle of Victory Monument or right almost under the Sky Train, there's food. And then all around there, it's. I feel like it's a, it really is a community because I think uh, Thai people just hang out. They, like, hang out at night all around Victory Monument, and there's just tons of tons of places to eat so much food there's so much food and speaking of that let's move over to the northeast quadrant now this is a weird one because if you go north from the victory monument a little bit sort of towards the Sanam pao bts station it's basically um, a big military base so that part i don't even think it'd be counted as part of the neighborhood because you can't live there you can't walk there you can't visit there so there's a big sort of chunk of it that's missing because it's all military and you're telling me it's a it's a thai military installation yeah, and on on the map, it's listed as the Royal Palace Guard Cavalry Division 2nd. So, take with that. Wow, okay. Result. So, but yeah, there's a big military base there. That being said, though, there are some sort of working class condos up there for like a lot of the local Thai people and vendors and shopkeepers and stuff. But there's also one of my all-time favorite noodle places just off of the main Victory Monument Circle. And I don't even know what they're called, but if you come down the stairs from sort of like the overpass, there's a little clong that runs along there, and you go across this little bridge, and it's just dozens and dozens and dozens of seats, and these restaurants, all they sell is boat noodles. You know, Kuti Yeah, sure. Yeah, and the little bowls, and the bowls are like 15 baht each, and it's kind of a competition when you go. I think if you eat like 10 bowls, you get a free bottle of Pepsi or something like that the last time I was there. <laughs> that was funny. But uh, yeah, last time I was there, you just you walk in, you're basically like, give me like 20 bowls of noodles, beef. Oh, that's great. And they'll bring them, bring them to your table and you've got this huge stack of bowls. So that's mostly what I go there for anyway. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And then a bit further up is sort of going east from there. You've got um, sort of a mini, a couple of mini mall structures, not big malls, but just kind of clothing stores and Dunkin' Donuts and, um, you know, very working class Thai. So it's it's it's, gotcha. it's popular with university students and and all of, all of the sort of younger Thai people that go up there to shop and eat and have fun. So, well, you know, I don't. I'm not so good on the the directions. <laughs> I'm not so good on the directions. Well, I'm not so good. I'm not so good on knowing. Like when I when I try to picture this in my head, I can't quite get it right. So I don't know. I don't know exactly where I am on the compass. But, you know, what? for me, Victory Monument is one of the first places that I used to go hang out in Bangkok. And it's basically because of one bar, you know. So I went there because of Saxophone Pub. Um, and uh, we talked about saxophone a little bit when we did our episode on live music. Yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, what, what's your take? I think Saxophone Pub, right on Victory Monument, it's probably the most famous live music venue in the entire country. Well, yeah, since you brought that up, let's move over to that quadrant. That is the southeast quadrant, or I guess between 3 and 6 o'clock on a, on a clock. And saxophone <laughs> is sort of on the opposite side of where the noodle joints are. It's just off the main traffic circle. And yeah, it's a legendary live music place known for its jazz and blues, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Right. Yeah? Yeah, you know, I can, uh, I can talk about saxophone because uh, I think I went there my maybe second week in Thailand... And uh, I did just a little bit of research for the show. Um, I'm a hardworking guy. And uh, I was <laughs> checking out the Saxophone Pub Facebook page and then their website. And uh, apparently they opened in 1987. Wow. So they've been around for uh, going on, thir- they've been around going on 30 years or so. Um, and I don't know, like, can, can you think of any other live music place you've heard about more than Saxophone? I mean, I, I think that's probably the most famous. It certainly is famous. And, um, I've only, you know, I've only been there about half a dozen times, but it's definitely one of the more recognizable landmarks in Victory Monument. Not even recognizable because it's it's not like it's got a big glowing neon sign or anything, but it's just kind of everyone knows it. And yeah, yeah. yeah some of Thailand's best musicians play there. But I got to say, last time I was there, I, I didn't really enjoy it. The music was just way too loud. I couldn't talk mm. and I just kind of sat there and, and mm. with my friends just kind of staring off into the distance yeah a couple things about saxophone um the musicians that play there tend to be very high level so it's uh i know a bunch of musicians here in bangkok and it's not easy to get a gig there so it tends to be very high level mm. a lot of the players are professional musicians who are who, who come in and do a gig so there's a famous saxophone player named uh, 
Co or Go, Go Saxman. So Go Saxman plays there a lot. He's probably the premier uh, saxophonist in Thailand, at least in terms of like being famous, plays there a lot. Um, the band uh, T-Bone, which has been around forever, which is kind of like a... Yeah. I guess they're kind of like a ska like Kind of like a band, weird ska, you know? reggae, blues. Yeah, they're yeah. like a very unusual band that uh, has has a big following in Thailand. Great live music. So if you've never heard T-Bone, you got to check them out. Um, there's some very solid blues bands that play there, jazz bands. But I think I think the, the thing that... Uh, that it's not really a warning, but something you should know about saxophone is they really do play a variety of music there. So if you just go in there on a random night, it may very well just be music you're not into. Uh, mm. And the seats are right up around the band. Like the band is right in the center of the bar. Like it's got an unusual layout where the band is right in the middle yeah. and you just sit around the band. So if it's music that you like, um, you're right up against the band. And I, I think it's a great place to listen to music. Word to the wise, check out the website before you go just to make sure they're playing what you want to hear. Yeah, for sure. That's yeah. it. I mean, I, I think yeah. they really play a variety. Like, you can hear blues in there, rock music, like kind of pop music, uh, you know, swing jazz, uh, all different kinds of stuff. So yeah. definitely check check the website. Well, saxophone sort of anchors this sort of quadrant of Victory Monument. And this is, I think, probably the most interesting area of the whole neighborhood. And this is the southeast corner and it gets into like there's some small and large condo buildings there's a ton of restaurants um there's a really skinny park called santipat park and this this whole area has got like those long skinny new york blocks where it's just like right. a bunch of long soys that are very narrow so yeah this it's a pretty decent park it's enough to get out and run around or go walk your dog or something like that and then of course this all comes down onto soy rangnam and if you ask i think most people they would, what Victory Monument, why they would go there, they would either say saxophone, food, or soy rangnam. And rangnam is really well right. known because there's a ton of restaurants, like cool Isan places and local Thai food joints. Um, it's anchored by Century, the movie plaza, which is like this four or five story miniature mall complex with a movie theater. And, you know, you got your Swensons right. and your Starbucks and your KFCs and stuff like that. So right. nothing mind blowing, but it is, it is a place that people go. It's always crowded. And um, then of course the King power building. Have you ever been to that place? Nope. Yeah. Well, it's really weird because it's, it's got like at the front of it, it's got like this big giant igloo looking thing made of glass. And then behind it, it's got a big water fountain and you got several levels of underground parking, and it's uh, basically like an IKEA, but for duty-free goods. So what you do oh, is you go oh, in, I see, and you buy stuff, but then you can only you don't walk out with it. You pick it up on your way out of Thailand. Oh wow! I've never. Uh, it's funny. I never. I've never been in there. Yeah, it's really. It's, so you're, it's really neat. You're kind of ordering. So you're kind of ordering something to pick up at the airport. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I don't know the, all the nuance of how it works, but that's how I understand it. So you go in there and you spend like 10,000 baht and then you leave with nothing. And you're like, no, that was weird. <laughs> so obviously, I mean, for people who live here, it's not very useful unless you're flying out. But for tourists, it's it's very popular, which is why it's just full of tour buses all the time. But yeah, then gotcha. the, and then Soy, Soy Rang Nam continues along a little bit. And then there's more restaurants, good seafood places and stuff like that. So um, that's what that's really known for. And then on the end of Soy Rang Nam on Paiatai Road, there's another quite well-known bar called the Skytrain Blues Bar or the Skytrain Jazz Bar. I believe it's called the Skytrain Jazz Club. And it, it is, it is a, it's, a, it's a very unusual place, very much worth checking out. It's, um, it's, a, good, it's a good example of how weird Thai bars can be because this, <laughs> this, this, uh, this uh, bar is called the Skytrain Jazz Club. And I think it has almost nothing to do with jazz. Like I've never seen a jazz performer there. I've I don't never think heard they any feature jazz, jazz. Yeah, I don't know why they call it the jazz club, but it is up on the roof. So I don't know if it's technically the fifth floor or, but essentially it's up on the roof and it does overlook the SkyTrain. So in that case, the name does make sense. It's called the SkyTrain Jazz Club, and um, it's just an unusual place. Uh, there's uh, no elevator all the way up, so you have to walk up like five flights of stairs to get up there. Um, yeah, already I'm and, not very interested. <laughs> yeah, you got to walk up five flights of stairs. And it's a building that uh, houses uh, like 
several art installations. So I get the feeling from that building that there's maybe one owner for the whole building and it's just kind of like their pet projects. So there's like kinds of cool art on the wall and then you just keep walking up and up and up and then all of a sudden you walk out onto this rooftop and there's a cool little a cool little bar there and they do have live music good live music although i've just never heard jazz there it is being it is kind of cool being eye level with the bts as it rumbles by every few minutes um yeah it's a nice spot to go for a drink and hang out with friends so um yeah so that's the southeast quadrant which is probably the most interesting area up there i would say and then um on the southwest quadrant there's almost nothing to talk about because it's almost entirely um, hospitals and um, research institutes. Yeah. So what is that? Is that Pi- that's Piatai Hospital, right? I uh, yeah. Just looking at the map here, there's the Faculty of Tropical Medicine from Mahidon University. There's a dental hospital. There's the Kidney Institute. There's a Ministry of Science and Technology. Uh, there's wow. Queen Circuit National Institute of Child Health. So it's just like this sprawling mass of hospitals and research institutes. So that must explain it because all the people that work there, they must live in cheap apartments around there. And that's why there's so much street food. Yeah, that's a very good observation because like a lot of the, a lot of nurses and, and medical professionals like that aren't very highly paid in Thailand. So Makes they would sense. probably like to live in sort of local housing, uh, cheap housing. And that's what Victory Monument has a lot of, if you know where to go. So, um, for sure. Yeah, and that's what they say. That's why the food up there is so good. Because if you want to go for some good Thai food, go where all the local Thais eat, and that's where a lot of local Thais eat. So, do you think this is getting more popular with with Farang now? Like, I know Soi Rang Nam has always been quite quite well known for foreigners because there's some sort of mid to upper range condos along there, some cheaper apartments as well. But um, our buddy Alessandro who helped us out here with the, some information. He now said he used to live on Soi Rang Nam, but now he lives in the northwest part of Victory Monument, so he moved. Well, I'll say this, uh, and I know we've talked about this before. Um, I, I think Victory Monument is a good place to go if you want to get away from the places that are all for wrongs. You know, so if you're mm-hmm. if you're like on Sukhumwit and you go to some some bars on Sukhumwit, it's 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 basically all farongs or farongs and their Thai girlfriends and that you know you know what I'm saying and so Victor Monument is a good mix because uh, there it's obviously mostly Thai but there are other farongs there so you're not you're not going to some place where you're going to be totally out of place you know right so, right. so but so it's a good mix if you, if you want to go to a place where Thais and farongs are hanging out Victor Monument is a good place yeah and it's it, they also i'm not sure of the status on this too but it also used to be a major hub for all of the little minivans that used to go out from all over for from this from bangkok That's all right. over down to patia and up to ayutthaya and out, out to further I, th- I think they have moved away they have moved away from victor Monument, but but uh yeah i'm not sure what happened with that but that used yeah. to be the hub but i don't i don't think it is anymore they did move because it got it got so congested there because it's where all the buses come through it's where all the minivans come through of course these like four major roads converge there and a couple of exits and entrances onto the expressway so it's just kind of if it's not the most traffic nightmared clog in bangkok it certainly could be and I think they wanted to solve that by moving some of the vans out of there. And that was kind of controversial when it all kicked off last year. But I don't Definitely. think the vans leave from there anymore. The good news about the traffic is you can always take the SkyTrain. Like the SkyTrain goes right to Victory Monument. So traffic becomes irrelevant if you just take the SkyTrain. Yeah, although you do have to be prepared because I have a funny story about Victory Monument. When my uncle came to visit for my wedding, um, he's you know 70 years old and he's very... Um, He's not very well well traveled, and he's kind of gets distracted easily, <laughs> you know. And so I said, "Let's go for noodles at the Victory Monument." I thought it'd be a fun little cultural experience. And he like he nearly had a stroke. He couldn't he couldn't deal with the noise and the lights and the sounds and the the people and the crowds and the smells and you know hmm. just the 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 sheer madness of it all, the sensory overload of it all. He was just kind of wandering chaotic. around like a zombie. <laughs> that's funny it is chaotic in a way it's it has in a way it's a little bit like chinatown it's like a thai version of chinatown because chinatown is very chaotic with lights and people and food um so in a way victor management kind of like that like tons of food tons of chaos tons of people that's a that's a good analogy yeah i think yeah basically it's like a chinatown light or ch- yeah. or chinatown yeah. in another dimension i don't know it's thai town in the middle of bangkok Ooh, thai town in the middle of bangkok 
which so makes sense. There, another, sh- there should be a Thai town in the middle of Bangkok. So yeah, that was just a, a quick look at Victory Monument. Obviously, Ed or I, uh, we're not experts on the place, um, but we do like going up there for various reasons. And I, I, uh, I haven't been up there in a while, actually, so I think it's time that you and I, maybe we should go on an official Bangkok podcast noodle outing. Sure, sure. Some jazz um, or something I, like that. I, I probably hit it. Uh, like I said, I go there for music, so I was there about a month ago. Um, so I'm, I'm always up for saxophone, yeah, although yeah. it is a bit of a crapshoot. It is a bit of a crapshoot, and you, as you pointed out, you should check the website before you go. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're new to Bangkok and you're looking for an interesting place to live, definitely check out the Victory Monument too. Um, there's, there's a, I think there's a wide variety of places to live, from like little, little studio places and kind of older buildings to taller condos where you can rent, you know, a, a big place on the thirtieth floor kind of thing. So there's a lot of different, a lot of options for people there. So it's 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 got cool. a, a little bit of something for everyone, I think. Cool. All right, let's get into some love, loathe, or leave, where one of us surprises the other guy with a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss and decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or hate so much that it makes us want to leave forever. And uh, this week, it's my turn. So, All right. Uh, <clears throat> Ed, let me ask you, what do you prefer? Are you a Coke man or a Pepsi man? Uh, I'm a classic Coke guy. Classic Coke guy, me too. Let me ask you this. What do you think of Est Cola? It's pretty gross. Uh, this is a, a, I, I know like this, this is a, a love, low the leave that I'm totally prepared for because I'm like, I'm a soda addict and it's, you know, I blame my parents, but I, I, I grew up drinking, you know, basically everything. I drank Pepsi, I drank Coke, you know, we had RC Cola. So I, I grew up drinking colas and I developed a, a, a taste for the original Coke. So uh, yeah. for me, it was like, a shocking tragedy when when coke developed the new formula the new coke debacle and i was i was incredibly happy when they brought back classic coke and so i've always uh i've always been fascinated by the difference between coke and pepsi so i've never been a pepsi hater like some coke people are pepsi haters i've never been a pepsi hater uh i just think that Pepsi's always sweeter and coke has some has a more complex flavor it's like a little bit slightly more bitter so i'm, I'm like a original coke guy and so uh when i saw est cola so for our listeners in case you don't know est is uh essentially a a thai copy i think it's a thai copy of pepsi right well here here's actually there's a little bit of history here here's what happened pepsi had been bottling uh its pepsi drinks in thailand since like the 1950s and the contract negotiation was unsccessful when they, when they came time to renegotiate the bottling contract with their local bottler didn't work out so Pepsi had to leave Thailand and in the meantime the bottler sort of took all of the infrastructure that was there and all the knowledge they had and they made their own version of a cola drink which was Est so essentially it is it, it is kind of a Thai version of, of Pepsi is what you're saying yeah and there was a while there this all this all happened probably three or four years ago but there was a while there where you it was almost impossible to find Pepsi in Bangkok because there was no one here to bottle or distribute it weird weird you know I vaguely remember this but I do remember seeing Est and trying it and to me it's even sweeter than Pepsi like that's how I I don't know I haven't checked the sugar content but I don't know. It has an even sweeter taste. And so as as a classic Coke guy, uh, I find it uh, offensive. Yeah, I would say it's 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 sweeter, but also more boring than Pepsi or Coke. Yeah. Um, it just, um, it's, it doesn't have, it, ta- it tastes gritty. It tastes dirty to me. And I, 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 I'm not going to leave because of it. I don't love it. So I've got to, I've got to come down with loathe on this one. Uh, I think we are in agreement. I'm going to go loathe. I'm going to go loathe on Est. Yeah, we loathe Est. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, let, let me make this point before we move on. Um, yeah. Last week on the episode, someone posted a comment uh, uh, w- where they appear to be mildly offended that we both said we didn't like fish sauce. Oh, really? I didn't um, see that one. Where were they, where did they post that? Well, here's what happened. Here's the interesting thing. Apparently, one of our listeners posted that they found it kind of odd that we lived here so long and didn't like fish sauce, but they deleted the comment. Really? Well, let's get ready for all the est lovers out there to start sending in hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's very funny. Anyway, so as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'd like to say thank you to Petri for lending us his support at the show shout-out level. And Greg, what did you find out about 
Petri. Well, Ed, as it turns out, I have met Petri a few times. Uh, he's a great guy from Finland who actually wrote a best-selling book on Bangkok. Oh, really? Yeah, which you can find at welcometobangkok.net. There's a free plug for you, buddy. Well, as it turns out, he is such a Finn that I discovered he is actually trying to contribute to Bangkok's greenhouse gas effect. I mean, he's trying to make it worse. Trying to make it worse. You see, Petri is a major sauna fiend back home. But despite Bangkok being the hottest capital city in the world in terms of average yearly temperature, it's still not enough for Petri. So he's trying to move the needle in his own unique way by keeping a wood-burning stove going 24-7 on the roof of his building. More wow. smoke equals more atmosphere, more trapped heat, and pretty soon you'll, be, you'll see Petri walking around town in a loincloth, steam rolling off of his back, looking for an ice factory to leap into to cool off in. So that's how the Finns do it. <laughs> he, wants, he wants Bangkok to be more like a Finnish sauna. Interesting. You know, Petri has to be the first pro-global warming person I've ever encountered. You know, hey, man. it's like, hey, man. you know, usually there's a debate about whether global warming is happening or not. But you don't see too many people who are actually want the globe to be warmer. Well, there you go. So if, if the upcoming winter season uh, this year feels unseasonably warm, we know who to blame. Blame Petri and his wood-burning stove. Well, before <laughs> we wrap up, uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to all of our patrons who are listening now. As we say every week, we don't run ads. Uh, we don't have sponsors. So uh, our patrons are very special to us, and we, we really appreciate the support we get from all of you. And if you want to get in touch with us, we are at Bangkok Podcast on Facebook and Twitter, or you can send us a message via the contact form at BangkokPodcast.com or just BangkokPodcast at gmail.com. We always write back. If you write it, we will answer it. Yeah, and you can also hit us up online where we post each episode and carry on conversations with our listeners. And uh, hey, if you can, leave us a review on iTunes to help the show. Someone named Mac 10 Killa left a review the other day, and he said, I love Bangkok Podcast. I listen every week. Last year, I traveled to Thailand for two months and learned a lot before I left. This year, I'll be moving to Thailand to have a daughter and become an expat. I continue to learn about Bangkok by listening. So thanks, Mac 10 Killa. Let me say this. Mac 10 Killer's got the best name I've ever heard. That's Mac 10 Killer. Great name. Not even Killer. Killa. He's that cool. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. So thanks, man. Uh, you can also reach out to me directly on Twitter, where I am, BKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll see you back here next week. I'm almost finished that bottle of Crown War Crown Royal that one of our patrons brought me from Canada. A bottle of wet whiskey. What am I going to do for a show drink? No. Back to tea, I guess. <laughs>